Manuel Meco, um, with the title Adama um, Passage. And uh, it will be followed by an artist talk right now to uh, talk a little bit more general about the work and the practice and um, also to give a little context um, to the work. So um, I would like to start the conversation with a thank you note. So, um, thank you, Dadu. Thanks, too. First of all, Emmanuel and Rico for showing your work in that context here, which is part of a um, group exhibition that I co curated with Alvin Light, um, and which will be opening on June 1st here in the same space. So, please take the date, June 1st, here at Nova Deutz. Um, it's also part of the program Looting the Normal, which is uh, generously funded by the Stiftung Kunst von Neustadt Kultur. Thank you for making this possible here. Um, so, my thank also goes to Alvin. Thanks for cooperating and for everything. To uh, the Lola Deutz team for the install and hands on and overall support. So, thank you, Johannes, Michael, Erika. Um, to Therese Schulheit and the Kunstwerk e.V. for the help, for, um, to the Pakt und Zollverein in Essen, who also joined tonight, where Emanuel was an artist in residence in February, and to Gas Foundation in Lagos, Nigeria, where I was a creator in residence last year, and especially to the CCA in Lagos, where I met Emanuel and we practiced for the first time. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you back here in the Boogie Beat and the Highland again. And um, thank you also to all the strong voices and common friends and spirits from Lagos, namely Alvario, Quadri, Alcandi, Matthew Blaze, Alcunde, Uruvak, Beniga, Alvario, Dulapo, Sonsina, Adeja Thompson, Emmanuel Balogun, Oshun, and Kimoja. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm done and we can start the conversation. Um, so I would like to start with talking about your process. So your practice is mainly based on performance. You also work with photography, with uh, workshops, with um, installation, and it's all coming from um, artistic research that is the base for all of your projects in different media. So um, maybe, yeah, you could give a little overview of how you um, start a project and develop a project and how it becomes a performance or medium. Um, thank you everyone. It's uh, really nice to see some familiar faces. Um, yeah, I think uh, because we talked about this, I, I just thought that in case I'm not able to think on the go, I just wrote down some pointers. Uh, just starting from one, some of the things that we've been talking about, both of us, with regards to shape shifting and, and taking shape. And um, what is, which I think is like a, a fundamental part of it practice and research, but I also want, I think what is also very important to me is um, some of the things that is um, necessitating this shape, shift, uh, at least within the context where I come from. Um, and I think it's just to give a kind of background, it's important for me to do a kind of um, autobiographical analysis, just starting from the line from my grandfather to me. Um, my grandfather, he died last year, but if he was alive this year, he would have been a hundred. So, and when I was growing up, I knew my grandfather as someone who was um, really connected to Igbo culture. The Igbo people are part of the, um, lived in the southeastern part of Nigeria for hundreds, thousands of years. And, um, so my grandfather was really, he lived in the same place all his life, he didn't move so much. And growing up I could see um, his connection to the culture, to the you know, performances, to rituals, to traditions. And 
When I was small, when I was really young, my grandfather was a kind of reference to someone who's, uh, who's refusing to become, in some sense, westernized because he didn't want to be baptized, he didn't want to have a, you know, be Christian. As a matter of fact, they forced him to be baptized at like 70, 80 before he died. Before, you know, at 90, he sort of rejected this baptism and so So he was really immersed in the, in the culture and in, the, in, in this sort of um, traditional practices. But my father uh, was a kind of colonial project in the sense that although he was born also within this context, um, at the turn of um, sort of um, when he was growing up, he was sort of uh, to get a job. He has to be educated within sort of the, the colonial um, context. Um, he had to go try to go to school, and most importantly, he had to migrate so to the north of Nigeria. And in Nigeria, you know, if, if, if you know a lot of a video about Nigeria, you know that it's just a kind of. Uh, collage of really different um, um, traditions, really different ethnic groups by the British um, to create this really huge um, country. So my grandfather moved, my father had to move from the you know, eastern part of Nigeria where you know, he was born to the north, to a really big city, which I doubt like my, if my grandfather had seen that so many people in his life. But my father moved to the north, to a different context, a bigger city. And um, it was in this place in the north that I, I was born. So growing up, I could see like this full immersion of my grandfather in Igbo culture. But in my father, I can see like uh, this, he was making a lot of effort to unite two things that seem in his mind opposite. Whereas on one hand, my father has become a Christian, he's become modern. Um, so in the big cities, he was, a, he's, he was Catholic and he would go to church and he would you know, observe Christian rites. But during the, the time when we would come back to the village where my grandfather lived, my father tried also to keep up to some of these traditional practices which he grew up in as a boy. But which by now we were told that these were demonic, these were um, uh, things of the devil in terms of the rituals and the tribal rituals and, and traditions and things. So by the time it got to my town, I feel uh, I was so much removed from this context in some sense that uh, I, I, I was experiencing what I wanted to talk about as like the predicament of the third generation in some sense. Because although my father, my grandfather was fully immersed in, in these traditions, my father had this sort of uh, you know contradictory kind of way of holding them together. But I couldn't I, I didn't have any connection to this to this uh, uh, to this culture in some sense. And this created me some kind of crisis. And I suppose that uh, for most like, young and uh, queer and curious artists coming out of Africa, this is one of the, the crises of reference, that we cultural reference that we have to deal with. But I mean, far from it just being a crisis, for me it was also um, it was also a call for a kind of a curiosity and experimentation in some sense within this within this sort of um, contradictory element that we have become or I have become a kind of uh, heir to the, the, we were, that, was, that we were thrown into in some sense. So I guess this, uh, this kind of uh, this need to experiment uh, was what what is driving my practice in some sense? It's a kind of response, in a way, to this to this crisis. And um, one way that I responded to it was, first of all, to begin to search for new forms and new materials that is within my practice, um, which sometimes radically just 
creatively build on sort of old traditions, but also radically kind of transgressing and break away from it. Because as I begin to try to understand myself, I begin to come to the um, conclusion that my interaction with the rest of the world cannot um, cannot fully be explained by this old and orthodox kind of modes of thinking and of being. And uh, one of my responses, again, first of all, to you know experiment with these forms, break it. Um, turn it out upside down, reject it. But another response, which I think also was, um, was really crucial in some sense, was um, for me just um, rethinking in some sense this, um, this hierarchy of Western thought that um, we have somehow come to inherit. And um, I don't use the word Western, really flimsy in the sense, but I just mean that um, Western in the sense of a system of, of thinking which is which has as, as its foundation some kind of dichotomy and binary. Because uh, um, I saw that it is possible to, to look outside of this, this system or to pick up like different kind of archives within um, indigenous uh, African systems of, of thought or performance and, uh, and come out with a different uh, conception of humanity or art or, or performance that doesn't necessarily, necessarily give us these um, contradictions between uh, nature and human, between material and non-material. Um, in some sense, between human and an object, in some sense, and human nature within this context of dichotomy is seen as something that is fixed and measurable, and uh, non-material things are, uh, are thought about within these Western archives as things that are, that have no agency, that you know, chairs and tables and things that can only act when acted upon in some sense. So there was this sort of um, dichotomy in some sense that I was trying to sort of break away from. And um, so I began to look into uh, masking traditions and performance traditions and um, all different kind of uh, um, what I would call like archives within West African traditions um, that uh, in a way subvert this uh, hierarchy of Western thought and Western uh, modes of being that we have inherited. And uh, let me just say that I, uh, I was talking to you about this also because it was the, the Senegalese philosopher, Suleiman Bashir Diagne who talked about, like, um, in his work, it's called like, African Artist Philosophy, and he was talking about how within our traditions in West Africa, this um, um, works of art, rituals, masks, and uh, performances, a way of um, documenting the world in some sense, a way of um, expressing a kind of world view um, for which we as um, young artists coming out of Africa should try to begin to translate. In some sense he was thinking and talking about them as some kind of philosophical text but documented in, in performance and rituals. And um, he was really critical of the fact that uh, earlier translators had really um, misinterpreted in, in the sense that missionaries would call uh, masks and masquerading a kind of a perf devil performances and um, early Western anthropologists also you know converted this mask into object of curiosities and you know were left in ethnographic museums uh, around Europe and uh, for him it's kind of imperative that we begin to rethink and you know re 
we look in some sense this, this archives within, within our oral traditions and um, in a way re, re represent and re, re um, and use them as a way of saying something about um, our contemporary situations. So in the past one or two years I've been really trying to extract in some sense decolonial and queer kind of um, uh, thinking by, uh, by studying this particular um, wooden helmet mask, which is called Adama. And um, Adama basically in Igbo language means beautiful daughter or beautiful woman. And um, the mask is within the context, so it's created within the context of a ritual and performance traditions where men would uh, try to embody or access a feminine spirit or we can say feminine energy by embodying and performing it in some sense. So on one hand to either celebrate or commemorate it and on the other hand in some sense to criticize, to criticize them. So I've been sort of trying to embody and think about what, uh, what it would mean to, within the context of uh, gender, within the context of the discourse about gender and sexual colonialism, which today denies, in some sense, the existence of queer people or queerness within, within the African continent. And then putting these objects in relation to other objects, also maybe we can talk about, um, but not just objects, but also other rituals and performance traditions. And some of them we talked about, like the the tradition of the female husbands, or the 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 fact that even with the Igbo uh, language we don't use the he, she pronouns in some sense, so we, we, we would address everybody in Igbo language as they. And so I would say, the way I would say, you know, he's going in English would be in Igbo, would be they are going in, they are going. So there was not just this um, um, he, she kind of distinction. Um, also, within also, we talked about this, uh, the concept of the perfect being within the the Dogon traditions, where the normal mask is it's within Western Sudan, in, in this cosmology, the perfect being is androgynous in a way, and um, the rupture that we see in the, the environment was basically um, the fact that these two aspects of being were separated, you know, in, in, in the beginning of creation. But also plenty of other like the Yanda also that we can maybe go deeply into. But in particular with the case of Adama, I also not only wanted to ask what this archives can can tell us today about uh, this you know, gender and sexual and sexuality, but also to within a kind of experiential kind of um, but to experience it for myself and see also what I can learn from the experience of being behind that mask um, and also being part of this performance tradition. And of course, what was really striking was the dysphoria in some sense of being inside the mask where inside of me I was saying, oh, I'm a man, but every other person was addressing me as a woman and calling me a damn arms. Some people slapped in your ball, but also within the public spaces to use it as a kind of, um, uh, as a way to bring out within public spaces the idea of uh, the concept of uh, uh, gender interaction within public spaces. Uh, the idea of, of course, of gender as a kind of performing, as a feed, dynamic field of play within Igbo culture, which within ritual we're able to construct and reconstruct and flow through in, in, in really different ways. And um, so this was just uh, the beginning of my, of my process of just
just thinking what this archive is going to say to us and um, how um, and how it will be possible to use performance as a way to reimagine and re um, rethink the the narratives that are surround surrounded them and if I spoke for a long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes you did but uh, thank you so much because you made the perfect like bridge between like your biographical starting point and then also um, some of the academic discourses that um, are very important right now for West African discourse and also queer theory and maybe um, to, um, to add on to that um, or to talk about your works that are even showing what you just talked about is that I think um, because you mentioned like transgression as a mode to break binaries and binaries between nature and human or um, between um, the spirit and the, the, the body, the physical being, and um, then also um, your three most recent works are exactly dealing with like gender, like um, breaking boundaries of gender. Um, the same today uh, with your work Adama. So, um, and when we talked last time about your work, I thought it was interesting because you mentioned those three words that are from, I think, the last two years in uh, kind of one sentence. So do you think of them as a development or as an ongoing um, process, a work series, uh, one could even say, um, consisting of three very different performances and research works. And this is um, the first of all, Praises of Ecstasy, which um, you premiered in the Frankfurt Lab, in Frankfurt am Main. And then the second time, and that's where I got to see it at the CCA in Lagos, and it will be on display also in Kampland in Hamburg, um, I think June 3rd or 4th, um, will be announced uh, in a program that is created by Matthew Blaze, um, queer activist from Lagos, Nigeria. So coming from that, that work, um, where you kind of um, try to break stereotypes or expectations that are related to masculinity. And I think uh, one could talk about masculinity in a very global sense, but also especially like, like in a West African context where maybe to give this kind of uh, facts or legal facts that like um, homosexuality and queer context discourse beings are criminalized still in Nigeria. Um, to that point that even like gatherings um, between queer communities can be disrupted by the law. So um, you work in that context and I found that very, um, very powerful back then, back then in Lagos. The CCA, the Center for Contemporary Art, which is in the in a district which is the mainland and you mainly have a working district there and it's a only art institution all the other galleries you would find on the island where it's more like a yeah maybe also a more international uh, context but you perform this piece in the cca lagos and it was you with a performer friend and it was a stage with a bed and you would perform like masculine desires and also feminine traits, so maybe you would like to go into that a little bit. Um, so yeah, after that it followed like the Adamo uh, piece uh, that you showed today and which started with a workshop where we can also see some uh, photographs and a uh, video piece in the, yeah, in the um, beginning of the space and um, which was also shown at the CCA in Lagos and in cooperation with the Finnish Cultural Center and the Berlin Republic. And then just to give, give a little like um, um, perspective to the future, like a project you're working on right now is EOS and Ancestors, uh, where you are uh, looking into the photographs of uh, Nigerian artists, Yoruba artists, Votimi, Fani, Kayodo. Mm, but maybe I think because this presence for ecstasy, your performance piece is such an important piece because it was the first one where you focus on exactly like gender expressions. Yes. So maybe you would just want to yeah, give a little overview about that. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I think like you said, rightly said, this work is part of a performance 
theology that I've created, and it's actually the second part. Um, the first part was uh, called Traces of Ecstasy. Um, and um, within just a bedroom installation, which I had designed on stage, um, I, I tried to, in some sense, experiment and desires and my queer fantasies with um, another friend of mine uh, because part of the question that I was asking was what would it first of all if it's possible for um, within the context of Nigeria for men to be vulnerable and to love each other and why is this problematized in a way but also just asking the question of what it would mean for two black men to love each other, leaving all of the baggages of patriarchy and society outside of the room. So within this bedroom installation, we you could see both men struggling with just this both our need to touch each other and you know achieve intimacy with each other, but also all at the same time struggling with it because there's this sort of Pierre in my society, just looking in through the film, the, 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 the sound installation and everything. And um, I wanted to sort of ex explore some of the things that I've been thinking about, you know, how this restriction of, and some sort of, sort of, sort of this policing of masculinity um, is creating in some sense men who have to find expression in more dangerous, dangerous ways. So that was the first beat. So all the time I'm just workshopping when I'm making this performance. It's the same way that I'm doing it now. The same way also that I did it in, in Essen at Pact, which was the first time that I showed in some sense or put together this this work here, which is the second part of this piece. And uh, in the end of May, I'm also going to start the the third part of the piece, which is called Eros and Ancestors, and I'm really also looking into the archives of Nigerian photographer, gay exile photographer, Rotini Fanny Kayode, and um, they will choose some photographs, 21, 20 photographs from his archives, and construct them as a kind of choreographic composition. But these three works then would be put together at the end of my process as the piece itself. So this is just a, a, a part of this piece and a part of the, the trilogy in some sense. The main work is going to be the three, the three project would be part of the, the, the main, the three project put together as a full piece which would use my body as a focal point to address issues of of gender and sexuality within contemporary Africa, West Africa, by drawing from these archives that I've been talking about, like triple indigenous archives of performance and masking and, and rituals, but also contemporary performance, but also looking at photography, looking at films from um, exile and um, sometimes unheard of um, queer artists you know, from from West Africa. So basically this is what the the, the final piece is going to be be like. Uh, but we did but while I'm waiting for for this, what I'm just doing is workshopping and doing artistic research and and um, looking for a space to put the pieces together individually, and uh, also keep keep showing them as like, like tiny pieces until I'm able to, to finish with the with the research and then put all of it together as a, as a kind of durational um, performance choreographic exhibition. Uh, you said we should talk about what else. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, looking at the time and I would like to give some time to maybe open for questions to the audience, from the audience, um, because I think at 9 p.m. there will be a lot of bass coming from the band. 
um, rich to look into those traditions and also um, like different like fluid concepts of like gender of um, of a society to learn something for today's discourses on on gender and nature. So. Yeah, I, I suppose this is what uh, what I'm trying to do with this this research. But uh, yeah, because maybe like I already said, within this archive, there's like different um, the conception of humanity and of human nature, um, and of again, which is my main focus of performance in some sense. Um, this again, if, if we look also within the field of performance or within just the field of like artistic tradition, this category is also of um, I don't know, performance or visual art or photography. Um, if I take the example of what we call the gender masculine, which is basically you know uh, a human being transformed into an ancestral spirit, but we did this. This, it, and then it's a huge exhibition that is moving on its feet. And within this exhibition, you can see within it movement and photography and paintings and sculpture uh, all put together, you know, and held together by this by this by this spirit that is that is appearing in some sense. So this rigid category, this rigid kind of separation of things. One, I don't see it in some sense if I look closely and. For me, what I what I see, it's not like these questions is not are not addressed, but it seems that what is mostly the most important thing within this archive is the question of composition in some sense and relation, putting things in relationship with each other and you know human nature or human being as a kind of composite, something a, a thing that is made up of a lot of forces, a lot of vital forces, some of which are material, some of which uh, are non-material in the sense, and how agency in some sense is your ability to be able to put all of these forces in relation to each other to produce something that is constantly transforming in some sense and constantly changing. So I think this is the, is the it, it seems to me like within the archive also of this this mask and this tradition, this is much more the question, you know, the question of relationship and composition, more than the question of um, ontology, more than the question of this division, this dichotomy. You know? And um, again, we talked about like the, the, the normal mask of the people from Western Sudan. You can see that this is, again, it's a sculpture that is, you know, the top is male and the, the, the bottom is female. And all the time, you know, within, if you look at the work of the ethnographer Masal Griol, where he interviewed some of the, the elders from the Nomo, all the time they were saying that the conception of the perfect being is this composite, this, this androgynous kind of um, human, which within Dogon cosmology was separated as the, in some sense, as the, as the head was ruptured. And so to become even, um, to become or becoming in some sense, it's not necessarily becoming yourself, but becoming the other in some sense, you know, composing, relating, putting yourself in relationship to that, to that energy that you, you were separated from, separated from uh, at the beginning of the art. So one can think about all of this within a kind of metaphysical or cosmological kind of context. But for me, it's just uh, it was just important to 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 ask the question: Is it possible to reimagine, you know, our contemporary thinking about gender and sexuality, our contemporary division between human and, and nature, between nature and culture, between being and non-being, and um, is it possible to again find this within this archive um, concept of humanity that uh, that doesn't necessarily rely on this dichotomy? <laughs> <laughs>
Please don't worry. <laughs> any, any more questions? Yeah. I wanted to ask uh, whether, were you also born Catholic, like your father? And uh, if, if the Catholic religion is it something that you completely reject and try to emancipate from, or are there some elements in it that are still relevant? Or Christianity, Christianity in general? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my father was not born Catholic. My father became Catholic in some okay. sense. So, yeah, so, for example, my grandfather was, you know, practiced, like, you know, Igbo spirituality. And so my father, in some sense, as a result of the colonial project, yeah, and became educated, became, and this time, like, education was really connected to the missionary. Um, institution to the religious institution. So I was born Catholic. <laughs> so my father became, but I was born in some sense. I was born Catholic. And um, no, I, I think um, in a, in a way, um, at the point I rejected Catholicism. But um, as I also began to understand more and more, like how in books tradition we have to say that we are wanting to stand, other things can stand beside and you know, with it. I begin to see how also um, Catholicism has almost become a kind of a cultural reference that I almost cannot escape. And um, and um, what I'm trying to do is to now put this religion in conversation with Igbo spirituality and um, understand that also that I can be multiple things, I can be composed in some sense of multiple forces and I can let the, um, and being a, a holy person in some sense to become holy is to be able to at least for me I use um, evil metaphysics as a way to to organize these different contradictory elements of myself and I see that even within evil spirituality these are not necessarily things that um, that cannot coexist in a way. And if you look at a lot of like um, Igbo, they call it Mbari sculpture, Mbari houses, which are ritual houses in, you know, in southeastern Nigeria, you can see that even within ritual, um, the people who are creating the sculptures and the shrines we are trying to integrate even foreign things. So you can see the picture of a colonial, the sculpture of a colonial master, the sculpture of a, of a leopard, the sculpture of seemingly foreign things, all existing within this sort of sculptural kind of archive and being held together by a kind of, a, um, how do you say, composition, composition, ritual composition and it, you know, and people would, you know, use it as part of a traditional um, rituals, traditional worship, and so I think more and more I'm trying to come to integrate myself and see how I'm all of these different things. And um, but I did have my phase of, uh, yeah, <laughs> Catholic rejection <laughs> and fun. But I also have the feeling that, um, uh, just to add to that, uh, that in this, our generation, um, as you described it so beautifully, that this coexistence and this acceptance of like also contradictions is really a topic again. So um, also when you talk at the very beginning about your biography and your grandfather and your father, um, where it's um, where it's forces and decisions and categories and binaries. I think uh, now the discourse is opening up a lot and also like um, like a young generation who is embracing those contradictions again. So that was my impression to a lot of conversations that I had with, with you and other artists and thinkers. So. Yeah, but I also think within like the uh, Fanonian, if you use like Frank's Fanon concept, that sometimes you, before you can understand things you have to first of all break them. So maybe it was important also that that rupture for me, that point where I had to 
rejected and said, well, this doesn't make sense in some sense. It was important for me to be able to also look at it as, a, again, as a kind of a field of play in a way that I can um, use. Uh, and I think, for instance, one of the things that is fashionable now, which is uh, the question of decolonization, and sometimes there's um, and within the circle, where, which I also frequent, you know, there are people who would say, well, I wouldn't read this scholar, or I wouldn't read that scholar. And you say, oh, I don't want to read Hegel, or I don't want to read Marx, or, or all of this. And we can ask, oh, but who do you want to read? And so I want to read uh, more uh, black scholars, so read more Fanon. And, and we, I, I can ask also, who was fun on reading, or who was fun in conversation with, or who were these thinkers that were reading in conversation with. And sometimes they're in conversation with this, this um, again, this Western discourses or, or elements that were maybe in contradiction even to, to um, what they were thinking about, and um, they were trying to understand it, to explain it, because they also have been I brought up within this context and they had to outright be rejected. And um, so for me, being able to understand the discourse of, of Catholicism was really important for me to serve as an altar boy, to, to go through baptism and confirmation. I think it was more important for me and when I rejected it was a kind of turning point within my artistic practice because I met like this really fascinating choreographer with whom who really challenged me about religion. I was uptight about it before. Who, who made me see uh, not, just, not just religion, but also, uh, again, identity as something that is, um, um, that is capable of being, you know, being transformed. You can mold it, you can change it. And it was just really interesting for me that I don't also have to look you know, far away to understand this. I only have to look just within um, traditional practices or within evil spirituality or within. This is not to say that this is all, this is also not in the in the Western archive or within Western thought because I think that of course what we call Western in itself is a kind of um, bond. It's a contradiction in a way where contradicting the things are responding to each other and. Um, you know, I think Franz Fanon put it well, this idea that, you know, you only have to, you know, look deep, you know, within the, con when you say civilization, the history of civilization is at the same time the history of barbarism, in some sense. So in, in a way, this contradictory element sort of, even within Western thought, has always been there, but I just, but realizing that I don't have to look within the, uh, within Western um, systems of thought, which for me, I wasn't well grounded in. And uh, to use Igbo language as a cultural reference to build my artistic practice and to build my thinking about transgressions, about um, uh, artistic uh, support in the status quo was just, uh, it came naturally. And um, I think when I, put, when I begin to Engage uh, Christianity and Catholicism. I, I was big, I was. It was easy for me to to break it apart based on that. Thank you so much. Um, let's maybe grab another drink and open the conversation to a just fluid conversation in the space. So I would like to thank you, the audience, uh, for coming tonight, and uh, a special thanks to you. Emmanuel, for all your energy to perform physically in the space and then have this wonderful conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you.